Good evening and welcome to this very special event. My name is Brian Frazee and I graduated in 2011 from UMBC with a bachelor's degree in political science and in 2012 with a master's degree in public policy. I serve as Vice President of Government Affairs for the Maryland Hospital Association and I'm proud to serve as President of the UMBC Alumni Association Board of Directors. I would like to thank you all for joining us for this evening's event. Uh, we are being filmed live at Okamoka in Arbutus. Okamoka uh, fosters a civic engagement uh, area that fosters collaboration between the community and UMBC um, while promoting economic development in southwest Baltimore County. We do want to note that we are following CDC protocols as it relates to COVID uh, this evening. Uh, Dr. Moffat and I, you can see, are separated by <laughs> a, uh, a plexiglass partition here. Uh, we all are wearing masks, uh, except right now when we're, um, we're safely distanced. Um, so we are following all COVID uh, protocols this evening. A couple of housekeeping notes. This is the first, uh, this recorded conversation is the first in our College Spotlight series. This new series is, is intended to highlight current college initiatives, research, and relevant discussion items on contemporary issues. Tonight's spotlight is on the College of Arts, Humanities, and Social Sciences and its new interim dean, Dr. Kimberly Moffitt. Uh, we are inviting you to participate in this conversation. Uh, please use the chat feature, uh, and we do have a team member that is monitoring that so that we can make sure that we get to each of your questions this evening. Also, for those of you um, who need it, we have a uh, CC icon on the lower right-hand corner of your video to access closed captioning. So with that, it is my distinct honor to introduce Dr. Kimberly Moffitt. Dr. Moffitt joined UMBC in 2006 as an assistant professor of American studies with a focus on communication and media. She is a professor of language, literacy, and culture, and an affiliate professor of Africana studies. She was appointed interim dean of the College of Arts, Humanities, and Social Sciences in August. And prior to her appointment as interim dean, she served as director of the Language, Literacy, and Culture doctoral program at UMBC. So Dr. Moffitt, uh, turning to you now, we would love for you to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your journey to UMBC and how your journey since you've been at UMBC has been. Sure, sure. Um, I have been at UMBC now 14 years and I would say it has been um, a the right spot for me um, in many ways. Um, I came to UMBC from DePaul University after um, serving there for a couple of years as a newly minted PhD, uh, PhD um, uh, graduate and found myself drawn to come back to the East Coast, which I'm originally from, and didn't want to raise my family in the Midwest so far away from my family and uh, looked for another place to be that would be the right fit for my family and stumbled upon UMBC. And certainly being in American Studies was the right spot for me at the right time. Um, I had the opportunity to do the type of research that I wanted to do around issues of media representations, talking about different American institutions that allowed me to help students explore what it means to be an American. Um, and I enjoyed doing that type of work. I've since then had a number of opportunities on campus that have led me eventually to to want to serve as interim dean for the College of Arts, Humanities, and Social Sciences. I had the opportunity to serve as faculty senate president for two years for the university. I have also had the chance to run summer programs for incoming um, undergraduate students and just a number of options that I think the university provides us so that we can grow. I mean, one of the first things that I heard when I uh, joined UMBC was, if you've got an idea, it can be, you just have to put in the work to make it happen. And I think that has fairly remained constant in my 14 years at UMBC is that as new ideas came to mind or new avenues that I wanted to pursue, um, found themselves, I found myself able to do many of those 
know simply because I dreamed it and I wanted to make it happen, so I did. Um, and I think that's the type of place that I want to be at, which is why it's um, kept me here for so long. I would also say, just as a quick aside, um, because I don't want to damper our mood tonight, but one of the features of UMBC that has really drawn me to this campus is how much community means to it. That yes, we are too big to know everyone's name um, on campus, but we certainly see ourselves very much connected in some ways uh, across campus. And it doesn't mean that I have to just be a member of my college and only those individuals do I know. I have the chance to interact with so many people on campus just in my day to day, whether I was a faculty member or now as an administrator. And what I found most unique about UMBC was that fostering of community. Um, I lost both of my parents since I've been at UMBC. Um, one of my mentors who was the previous um, director of the language literacy and culture PhD program I also lost during this time and I saw a community rally around me and find ways to support me and make sure that I was okay and that I could continue to thrive here at UMBC and that's one of the features that easily makes this a place where I can stay. That's great, that's great. And Dr. Moffitt, um, last year UMBC was recognized as a Carnegie Community Engaged University, to that's your right. point, um, that acknowledges a commitment to strengthening the bonds between campus and the community. Um, can you tell us why does community engagement matter um, to you and also can you highlight the college's initiatives that illustrate this in action? So what's interesting is this, um, I have seen in my 14 years that aspect of who we are evolve. And as it seemed that from the moment of joining UMBC's faculty and each year we seemed to draw and attract more faculty who wanted to do work that extended themselves into various communities, primarily in Baltimore City. And as a city of, uh, as a resident of Baltimore City, that drew me as well, that I thought, oh, I have the opportunity to work with other colleagues who are dedicated to seeing what can exist um, or what type of research and the reach of that research into communities um, by being a part of communities. And so when UMBC decided to um, pursue that particular designation, I knew that it would be something that we could do. I knew that it was something that Carnegie would say, absolutely, look at what this institution is doing. Again, we aren't the size of a number of, or even, you know, the other, University of Maryland Research Institute um, uh, institution down the road, but we're not that size. But boy, are we mighty in terms of what we are committed to and setting our minds to do and extending ourselves out into the community. And so when I think about so many of the projects that we um, and initiatives that we have had over the years, whether it's breaking ground that allowed um, faculty members to um, receive support to do research out into community. The same things with the Kaufman grant that we had years ago that started some of the research that I eventually continue to do. Um, that Kaufman grant years ago was an opportunity for me to go into a school and do media literacy um, research and, and um, skill building exercises with middle schoolers. What evolved out of that in a very, uh, something that was such a small project and what I was interested in doing ended up being such a significant um, seed for what grew into my commitment to wanting to create spaces um, um, act in educational spaces like that for young children that I eventually started working on creating um, a charter school. And so Baltimore Collegiate School for Boys is a project that I worked on for a number of years until I was able to open up a school uh, an all-male academy for 150 Baltimore City boys. The school now has over 500 students. So those types of projects are very much a part of who we are. I think about, again, the work that Liz, um, Lynn Casabon has done in visual arts, working with incarcerated women and helping to allow them to tell their stories. Um, Bill Shoebridge and his work on mill stories, going into certain parts of Baltimore to make sure that we are hearing the stories of those who are working in the various mills and industries in our city that are now gone. And what is 
what is their story now? What is the narratives that they have to tell? Um, there are so many other initiatives that I could talk about all night because we are the college who is so committed to doing this type of work that we find ourselves just reinventing the wheel and saying, what other ways can we be connected to the community? Not to just go in and, and of course, in a paternalistic way, feel like we're giving something or doing something for a community, but becoming a part of the community and working with them in order to solve problems. Wow, well, Dr. Moffat, you've been talking about your 14 years at UMBC. Um, as a faculty member and you're active in education and other community initiatives in the area, how do you envision um, those experiences in your new role as the interim dean of the college? Well, my colleagues are helping me do that fairly easily. Um, you know, when new ideas come across my table that again draw us back out into the community, I am I am excited and I say, oh, here's an opportunity for me not to have to relinquish that part of who I am as a scholar and a teacher, but to still be able to be connected and committed to that type of work. Um, a lot of the work that we, we um, the college now has a, a grant with the Mellon Foundation that is allowing us to dive deep into conversations about racial equity. Again, something that is very core of our college. You see those types of conversations happening and happening often in our classrooms within our college. So we are the place where we can have those conversations, but we can also figure out ways to strategize and have um, ways to solve some of those issues and so what I see is just simply an extension of what I was able to do as a faculty member now I have the opportunity to dabble in all of it because it's coming from different directions depending on the departments and programs that are interested in bringing those issues and I think that part for me is exciting because I don't as an administrator want to complete completely relinquish that part of who I am because that part of who I am is how I got to be in this spot and so I want to hold on to that and I want to support our colleagues who are still doing that type of work and making sure that our identity reflects that at UMBC but it also reflects that among those who are looking at UMBC. Great um, and just a reminder for those of you who are watching from home please submit your questions in the chat feature again we do have um, someone monitoring that and they will let us know when a few come in, but we are going through a few, a few predetermined questions here <laughs> while we're waiting uh, for folks to chime in. Um, uh, and I, I know this next question very well, uh, Dr. Moffat, you've recently reached out to uh, alumni association board, um, board members who are graduates of the college, uh, myself being one of them, uh, to learn about their experiences and invite suggestions on improving their alumni experience. Um, I know, again, I received a call and appreciated that personal outreach, but from these calls, can you share any of the reactions you've uh, received from those board members or any thoughts or yeah. innovative ideas of, of how to engage alumni so, uh, in the college? So when I first decided to do this, I had no idea it was that many of you um, that <laughs> represented uh, our college on the alumni board. Um, but once I did learn um, how many, I thought this could be an interesting um, additional project that I can consider. Um, I will tell you that when I decided to um, seek this opportunity as interim dean, I did reach out to OIA and say, what are we doing? How are we doing in terms of our connection with our alum and, and fundraising and engagement, et cetera? And I was shocked to learn that even though we make up over half of the alum that end up graduating successfully from UMBC, just a very, very tiny percent um, find themselves able to or willing to give back to the institution. And I thought, here's a place that I can have an impact. Even if I am in this role for just a short period of time, there are some things that we can do in the short term that hopefully lays a, a foundation of how we're engaging our alum to keep them coming back to events, keep them coming back to homecoming, keep them coming back to our performing arts and visual arts performances on campus, um, keep them coming 
coming back to, you know, present at um, alumni events that departments want to um, um, support and share with um, their undergraduate students in hopes of networking opportunities. And so I have really enjoyed those conversations. And I have learned quite a bit about each um, alumni member, uh, a board member, but also a number of ideas that they have been able to provide us. So I will share with you very quickly, one of the uh, board members I spoke to spoke about his experience at UMBC as very much, you know, an, a means um, to an end, mm -hmm. that he needed to get in and get out because then life was going to begin for him. And I remember hanging up after that call and thinking, wow, is this going to be the experience? Because as an academic, I'm always interested in the stories where students are talking about how much they gain from the four to five years they were at UMBC, how much they found themselves broadened and stretched and opened up more in terms of, of a wide range of perspectives that they learned while here. And here was a graduate that, you know, was still interested in being connected to the institution by serving on the alumni board, but was very clear that there was a means to an end. And so I reflected on that for a while and thought, Yes, but this person probably represents a number of our graduates. Even if it's a small percentage, it's still a percentage. And what I felt as a result of that is we needed to know how to tap that person and that population like all of the others so that they know that UMBC doesn't want them to see this solely as a means to an end, that we want them to continue being a part of this family and finding ways to keep them engaged. And so that becomes like a reference point of if I can get individuals like that, then I know we're being successful in terms of reaching our, um, graduate, reaching our graduates. I also think so many of um, the ideas that I have been able to generate rate have come from the alumni board members and I've thought right. oh wow okay this will make life much easier because I don't have to create these ideas myself I'm being given this information I'm being given the support the number of uh, board members such as yourself who have extended themselves to say whatever you need I'm happy to come back and talk on an alumni panel I'm happy to offer additional financial support for events mm -hmm. whatever I've asked for they have already extended to me and really been excited about being able to have this connection with the dean in a more intimate way and i'm glad that i'm able to provide that that's great well i know i speak for my fellow board members when i say that we appreciate the time uh, you're taking out of your busy schedule to have those conversations and i have to say i too was surprised when i saw the list <laughs> of how many of us were alum of the of the college yes, so that's that's yes. great we look forward to, to continuing that partnership um, you, you well know that UMBC um, is known for its commitment to diversity and social justice. Um, we're interested in hearing from you on how um, the alumni can support the work um, in that space of the college and also how the college can support alumni who are doing work in this yeah. space, especially right now. I mean, it's such a, a core part of our identity, right? Um, so I don't think it can go away. Um, at least I would hope that we would never want to relinquish that part of who we are. I mean, it's certainly something that is attractive to me personally about um, our institution, but I also think it is attractive to others who see us and recognize that walking through our commons, those flags are not just for decoration they mm -hmm. mean something because they represent so many of the students that are on our campus and that is just I mean a very um, visible way of demonstrating diversity but I think it's an important reflection about who we see ourselves as being um, what I would say is that um, we're always looking for or I'm certainly looking for our alum to want to be engaged in a number of the conversations those difficult conversations that we're having now right we are in what I've been referring to as a perfect storm where we've got you know this global health crisis that we're all impacted by while at the same time we're dealing with tremendous um, uh, um, civil unrest while also 
in the midst of this political campaign that has a number of us on edge and trying to figure out what does this mean about being an American, right? And so that in many ways is a perfect storm, even though it's not a comfortable one, even though it's one that you know has us sitting on this platform with a plexiglass between us and wearing masks, that it's still an opportunity, a silver lining in all of that for us to do exactly what I said I wanted to do as interim dean. So instead of coming in and just trailblazing and fixing or making changes that look like what Kimberly wanted to do, what I came in and did, which is exactly what we should be doing, is to pause and reflect, listen to one another, and then decide if there are ways in which we need to revisit or reconstruct the way that we've been doing things. And I would say that requires our alum to also be able to reflect and share with us what ex past experience, experiences at the university were and ways in which we can learn from those historical contexts, but then also to champion for us what they are experiencing in their own lives in terms of their professional opportunities, what they're doing on a day-to-day -day basis in their professions, um, how they are engaging their own children, and giving us that insight and information so that we can then create the better space that we are at UMBC. I think there's a lot that is great that's happening at UMBC. But I also recognize that just like any other American institution, that we are grappling with our issues around structural racism, other issues of inequity, whether it's gender or sexual orientation, whether it's religion or class, all of those are issues that we too are impacted by simply because we are in another American institution. So we've got to learn more so that we can then reassess what we need to do moving forward. So I would say that's the way that I see alumni playing a role. What I would say what we're trying to do on campus is having those hard conversations. We are doing, um, I'm amazed at the number of sessions that our research centers have been sponsoring literally since COVID started. When our school closed in mid-March, our, our research centers immediately, whether it was the um, Imaging Resource Center, whether it was the Dresser Center for Humanities, whether it was um, what we refer to as CS3, which is the Center for Social Science Scholarship. All of those centers were able to come together and say, how are we going to address some of the key issues that we are being impacted by right now? Whether it was the conversation on this pandemic and what it meant, or racial inequity issues that um, we were mired by throughout the summer. And certainly even now, presently, the conversations that we're having about the political climate in this country. All of those are things that we are doing because we recognize how important diversity is to our society and to us as individuals, and only grappling with those types of issues will make us a better place. That's great. And Sorry this... for being so long-winded, but it is, I'm so passionate about that part of who we are as a college because we do it and do it well and are constantly looking for ways to make ourselves better at it and, and willing to even take the hits to say, that didn't go so well, but we then find ourselves saying, okay, we paused, we reflected, and we listened. Now we can move forward and do something different. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. I certainly appreciate that. And we, um, uh, we've identified many of these issues as a priority on the board, and we'll look forward to working with you and others um, on the campus to continue the those more conversations. The um, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. And you referenced, um, Dr. Mm -hmm. Moffat, that uh, this year has been challenging on multiple to, fronts. To say um, the least. And so, and you referenced conversations too, and having difficult conversations. And so, we were wondering your insight on how to have those difficult conversations in different aspects of your life, whether yeah. it's with family, colleagues, um, you know, at the college or, or what have you. Yeah, it's a tough question 
Because um, context matters. There are so many um, scenarios where um, immediately trying to engage in those tough conversations is just inappropriate because you're not going to be heard um, or listened to. And so I think it's important for us to think about um, our context, who are the individuals that are involved. But I know that, for instance, as we are approaching um, the holidays, and mm -hmm. for those of you who are willing to get together with family members, because I'm staying put, <laughs> 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 but for those who are, that many of these topics are going to come up, right? It, they just cannot happen. You know, we will have, by the time thing, um, the holiday Thanksgiving occurs, we will have been a few weeks away from um, the the national election, right? And a number of other decisions that have been made. Um, and so that's clearly going to be a primary conversation for so many families and friends. And so what I would say again, similar to how I answered the first question is it really is about our ability to remain open so that we can hear and listen to others. I do think that there is this um, moment that we're in largely because of social media, which I think has tremendous value to our society, but has also put us in a position where we don't necessarily listen to a lot of, um, um, we don't listen to each other. We don't listen to each other well, I should say it that way. That we find ourselves so ready to respond to how someone uh, or what someone has said that we don't even listen to what it is that they just shared with us. And it requires us to pause so that we can listen to those words and then find a way to um, reflect on them before we respond. Um, that's a tough skill for a number of people, especially in the Twitter sphere, right? Mm -hmm. When you've got uh, a certain number of characters to be able to convey what you feel about what's happening in society and you're not interested in engaging, you're just simply interested in dumping and putting it out there how you feel and what your view of the world is, but you never want to sit and say, well, wait a minute, that person said something different than what I think. Maybe I should consider how they are viewing the world. And that's the skill that I think so many of us are missing. And I'm not even thinking about it in terms of civility, because there's a lot of usage of, we just need to be more civil with each other. I don't even think that, because I think there's something very healthy about engaging in debate. Um, I just think that where we've gone wrong is we haven't been willing to actually debate. We've only been willing to bark and yell at each other without actually listening to one another. So for me, listening is at the core of that. It's about listening. And it means that even if you disagree with someone politically, that you're open to listening to them to hear what they have to say before you decide to respond. Um, for me, as an individual, I, I do embrace the notion of being a lifelong learner. And so as much as I think I already know, there's still so much for me to know. Um, I used to, my, I remember uh, several years ago, my um, husband said to me, at what point will you just be comfortable and satisfied? And I said, that's called death. <laughs> because if there is not any more for me to learn and experience and know, then let me go. Like, I'm done. Because I'm always interested in what more can I learn? What more can I understand? What more can I experience in a vast world like this? And if we could all just think about it from that perspective for a little bit, then it would allow us to open ourselves up and listen to what someone else has to say, even if it is different than what we believe. That's great insight. Thank you. Um, I'm happy to report that we do have two questions, I believe, <laughs> from, uh, from the audience, uh, from those of you at home. So I'm going to pull these up here. Um, our first question, Dr. Moffitt, from our, our audience at home, if a generous alum took up your challenge to give, what are a few of your top priorities you'd love to see funded? Oh my goodness. <laughs> That is like Good the, question. oh my goodness, but it's the, <laughs> the question, uh, the dream question for a dean. 
<laughs> like you have money, give. Um, there are, I would, I would say that um, some of the work that's happening in our research centers is where I really would like to see a lot of the support. Um, because again, um, what we have done as a college is, is reflected um, an image in which we do want to remain community engaged. And that means community engaged scholarship. Right? And so in order to do that type of research, it does require support. So our research centers become a funnel for where those funds can come in so that we can give support to faculty members to then go out and do the research. What I would also say about that though, because I don't want this, this to look as though it's just for these particular um, scholars to go and do their research. So much of who UMBC is, especially that connection to undergraduate research, means that faculty members include undergraduates in all of those projects. So when I've got Nicole King who is going out into Curtis Bay working in neighborhoods to um, sh demonstrate connection to um, making sure that certain spaces and places in those communities are revitalized and protected because they mean so much to a community. She doesn't go by herself. She goes with 20 students that mm -hmm. she introduces to different parts of Baltimore City, but also who get to learn about the history, the context of these um, spaces and places, and why they become important to helping a community continue to be vital, continue to exist, continue to be talked about. So that's one of the primary areas that I would see. Um, I also believe, of course, focusing on our students, that another area would be scholarships. We've got a number of scholars programs that really support um, students who are doing interesting work, who want to give back to their communities, who want to be a part of the society, the society in bigger ways. I think about, for instance, our Sondheim Scholars Program as one. I also think about our humanities scholars and our Linehan scholars who are specifically supporting arts students. All of those programs in particular, I think, do um, really reflect well on who we are as a college. And having that support come in to make sure we can continue to extend scholarships to more students who are interested in doing that type of work is exactly what I'd like to see done. That's great. That's great. And thank you for submitting that question. Yes, to... and please give me a call. <laughs> <laughs> um, OK, our second audience question, uh, Dr. Moffat, what does your current reading list look like? And rethinking some of your American Studies courses, what texts would you include in your syllabus at the moment? Oh my goodness. This has to be from somebody who <laughs> <laughs> I had as a former student. <laughs> um, so I will be truthful in this moment that um, there's very little that I have had the chance to read since I took this position. Um, in all honesty. Um, so much of what I have read um, is focusing on the profession and making sure that um, I am always thinking about and retooling the skills that I'm developing and that I already have to do this job and do the job well. Um, I would also say that I spend a lot of time reading the Chronicle and Inside Higher Ed um, to have a lay of the land of what's happening in higher, um, higher education. I mean, think about it. With this pandemic, there's so much that has a ripple effect down to our colleges and universities, including those who are really struggling at this time. And so there's a lot of attention I'm paying to to see the lay of the land um, regarding um, higher ed, and not so much except for the areas in which I'm still trying to hold on to my own research that I am looking at. Um, so I do think there are some interesting texts out there that would be considered, but they're more popular texts because I think those are the texts that are accessible to students who are interested um, in knowing what is happening in our society now and being able to connect. So I would mention the Vanishing um, Half as one of those texts. I would certainly um, mention Isabel Wilkerson and her newest mm -hmm. book, Cass. Those are the two that stand out for me right now. Um, I also have on my nightstand, but have yet to even um, begin it, is Little Fires Everywhere. Mm -hmm. And even though it's already appeared as a series on Hulu, I'm determined not to look at that because I don't
don't want that as the shortcut or the cliff notes. I really want to engage that text, but it's not one that I feel like I've had the opportunity to engage quite yet. I would also say, and this is just in a personal aside, is that I spend so much time on the screen that I just really look for things that um, move me away from having to use my eyes in a very strong way. I mean, that's why I'm sitting on, on camera with glasses now instead of my contacts because of spending so much time behind the screen that a lot of times after I am done with my day, I'm not reading, I'm not looking at anything. Of course, I'm not purposely looking at anything. I'm just trying to enjoy the time with my family. That's great. That's great. And my wife and I recently watched that Hulu series, uh, Did you? Little Fires Everywhere. I have not read the book, though. My wife has. <laughs> so maybe I need to get on that. <laughs> <laughs> did she um, enjoy it? She did. It's she another did. great story. Um, I have probably read chapter one of the book, okay. so I have a sense of the primary characters, um, but that's the extent of it. But knowing who the um, actresses are in the series, I know that it has to be a great series. Yep, absolutely, yep. absolutely. Um, okay, our third audience question. Um, can you speak to ways alumni outside of Maryland uh, can support the university besides financial contributions? <laughs> um, is did there you a... stick that in there or did, that, or did the um, questioner um, raise uh, that point? Apparently the questioner did, so <laughs> kudos to them. Um, besides financial contributions, and is there a plan for things like virtual panels and meeting greets? Yes, with the college? yes, absolutely. So they've already answered their own question because this is, um, in fact, I can't take credit for it. It's coming from the alumni board members that, okay. that many of them, even internationally, not just speaking about within the country outside of Maryland, that I was hearing from alumni board members to say, why can't we take advantage of this virtual platform right now? And in this particular space, we should be inviting alum to come and do different alumni panels, either for specific departments or in a broad way that could be a lovely networking um, event for our, uh, um, for our undergrads or our um, students in general, but also an opportunity to create little mixers where we're building communities within that alumni association and among our alumni. Um, and I think that is an area that we are growing to do. We haven't done as much, but this particular virtual platform allows us to do that, where I can bring in some of my graduate students who um, finished their PhD in the language literacy and culture program who are in Brazil or are in Germany. Like, how fascinating is that to be able to bring these voices to the table to say, this is what I decided to do with my PhD and I'm doing it outside of the US. That's a, that is one of those silver linings that I was talking about, that the pandemic and all of the other things that are happening in the world right now has afforded us. And we really do need to capitalize off of moments like that. I've also, again, an idea from another um, alumni board member, that whole notion of mixers, where we have an opportunity to create, you know, those who just finished in economics or those who just finished in media and communication studies, or those who are are associated with pot, with particular programs while they were here, like Model United Nations. All of those would give us an opportunity to reconnect alum while also letting them know that we're interested in them, not just for the financial contributions. We're also interested in them because we want them to remain a part of the family. That that's the piece that I think we have not done the best job on. That when I've spoken to the alumni board members, what I constantly hear from them is how important faculty played a role in their lives while they were here. And they are able to call, I mean, even I talked to an alum, alumni board member who graduated in 1988, and she was like, and these particular professors were the ones that, you know, meant the most to me or really had an impact on my experience at UMBC. The fact that she is now still very much connected to the alumni board, uh, alumni association 
Association board lets me know that those people meant a lot to her and she still wants to find a way to give back. So that's another way to be able to give back without feeling like you are only being asked for um, contributions. And I don't want our alum to feel like that's the only purpose they serve for us. We really do want them to feel like that family, that community, they felt like they were very much a part of for that four to five or six years while they were here. We want that to continue and we want them to see us still very much as a part of that community. That's but great. we like the financial contributions too. <laughs> of course, of course. Uh, there are many ways to contribute. And, and if I may, um, I did want to mention um, a new initiative uh, that the board and, and I know UMBC staff are doing around People Grove. Yes. Um, so People Grove is a new, um, new online platform That's that will right. help connect alumni to current students and foster some of those relationships and mentorships, That's conversations, right. um, engagement. Um, and so for those of you watching, please look out for more information on that soon because it's just getting rolled out. Again, that's called People Grove. Um, I saw a demo of it the other day and it's, it's very easy to use and I think it'll go a long way. Great, great. Um, especially leveraging the, the online platforms, like you said. Absolutely. Um, it does make things easier uh, for folks that are, that are very busy. So um, a, another question that came in from the audience, uh, how is today's current climate going to affect the types of classes and ways of, of learning from here on out? Yeah, so I don't think, um, I, I certainly think in our college, we will still con continue to do the work that we've always been doing uh, around issues of sense of belonging and identity and social justice issues, as well as ways to solve problems that are um, occurring in our society. But I do think we've got an opportunity here. Again, I'm always looking for the silver lining and the silver lining in that regard is we have an opportunity to capitalize off of the modes of delivery of course delivery at this point so even though UMBC has always been seen as a place where because of our community we really minimized um, how many online classes that we offered I do think this has opened the door for us to say there are some other options for us to content uh, consider that we don't just have to offer that that fabulous type of course that we have offered over the years in person that there may be an opportunity to also extend such a course beyond the campus community and allow individuals from various parts of the country and world to still have access to those types of courses. What I would also say is I think, you know, some of the initiatives happening on campus, in particular the Finish Line program, which was established by um, our enrollment um, management division where we recognize that there were a certain percentage of students who had just a few more courses necessary in order to attain their um, degree that we reached out to many of those to say, hey, we have this platform that we are using right now to teach classes. Is there an opportunity for you to also take classes so that you can successfully complete your degree? Um, the Finish Line program has been very successful in drawing such students back. I made personal calls to some of my former students who I knew were just shy of a few classes to be able to um, attain their degree and strong arm them a bit to say, this is the time for it to happen. If there isn't a better time, it is now. Um, because we can extend so many of our classes to you from the comfort of your home or your office. You don't have to come to campus. Why not take advantage of this opportunity so you can continue your career in the way that you'd like to by having that completed degree? So I think that as a, mo a mo mode of course delivery is affording us an opportunity to expand ourselves, um, to make ourselves more known, um, and to successfully reach more students to engage the types of courses that we offer in um, our college. Great. Um, and I don't think at this time we have any additional um, questions. Oh, how could I have forgotten this question? So the question that everyone has been waiting for, oh, uh -oh. Uh, we didn't want to save it until near the end. Do I know this one? Um, 
So I understand that you are a huge fan of Prince. Oh, oh, okay. Um, I can handle and this. And so one. we wanted we wanted you to, to expand upon that a little bit. Um, so I yes, I am a huge fan of Prince. It is the first uh, um, concert that I got to go to as a teenager. Uh, was was his Purple Ring um, concert in my hometown, and I am just mesmerized by someone who um, was so talented as an artist. Um, he was a genius in terms of his ability to play a wide range of instruments and produce for so many other people. Um, his music that he created or that he wrote for other artists. I also think he was this complex creature who, you know, blended spirituality and sex and, um, um, you know, his political views all in one song at times that I'm very fascinated by his ability to be in many ways his own person um, without feeling like he had to explain himself to others. Um, I remember again as a teenager, you know, um, in, in my time as a teenager in the 80s, we were still kind of cutting pictures out of books, out of magazines and pasting them on our bedroom walls to say this is who we are most connected to. And my sister, we shared a room together and she had Michael Jackson all on her side of the room and I had Prince all over my side. And my mom um, came in one day and she was like, why must you like a man with who wears heels? <laughs> <laughs> and I just thought, what a cool human being to say, this is who I am, and this is how I show up in the world, deal with it. And he felt very comfortable in which doing so, and it probably explains why I'm oftentimes in three inch heels myself. Um, truth <laughs> nice. be told, truth be told. Um, so yeah, I just think he's a fascinating individual that um, has a lot to, uh, who offered a lot to the world. Um, and even in his untimely death, I think there's still so much more for us to gain from him. Absolutely. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. Well, I, um, uh, I do want to give a very special shout out to my wife, Angela, who is um, watching tonight with our two daughters, <laughs> Caroline and Cecilia. Um, she's, she too is a, uh, an alumni of the college and of UMBC. Um, but the reason I say that is, um, you know, we do have two daughters and uh, she and I talk a lot about um, the impact of imagery um, in society on Absolutely. them as they, they grow up. Absolutely. Um, and know you've done some research around Disney princesses and, and you know, princess culture, if you will. Um, I was hoping you could talk a little bit more about that and perhaps even if I may uh, ask your advice. Um, as, uh, as someone who is, you know, uh, going through parenthood right now. Oh, I don't know if you want my advice. Because <laughs> my first response would be, don't watch Disney. <laughs> but, uh, but I don't want to be sued by Disney. Um, I just want to be critical of it. And that's what I would encourage parents to do, is that I think um, that particular um, uh, industry or that particular institution is so connected to what it means to be an American child, right? So it's very hard to even try and navigate around something like Disney. But what I would say is that um, it's not all bad, it's just that it shouldn't be the way in which we craft what it means to be a child in the U.S. And oftentimes it is that that becomes the way of us understanding what it means to be a child in the U.S. and how you are to grow up. And so some of those um, images that I think are um, projected onto our children send messages of um, lack, um, of limitation, of inability to achieve certain things, or who has access to certain spaces. Um, if you start to look at um, Disney in terms of its, its representation across race and ethnicity, then you also start to see that there are uh, limitations being put on children that really, um, for me, was not the message that I wanted to give to my children. So even after they reached a point that Disney was so pervasive that everyone at school was talking about particular uh, shows that were on, especially preteen years, um, I found myself sitting next to them and watching all of them. And the reason I wanted to do that is because I wanted to check whatever was happening on the show as it was going on. Will my children probably be on someone's couch, uh, some psychologist's couch saying my mom did this to me? <laughs> 
probably. Um, but what I felt like was so significant was for them to understand that the world that I was trying to create for them was one that was vast and they could do anything. Instead, Disney was creating a world that said, this is all that you can do. This is where you get to reside. Um, and that bothered me. And so that was part of the reason why I decided to start doing research in that area. Um, I also got into the Disney Princess, um, specifically that chain or that um, brand because of Princess Tiana from The Princess and the Frog, which is the first black princess that Disney um, has done in its over 100 year period. And based on that, I felt like there were messages that were being sent about who actually has access to, to being a princess and what a princess needs to show up looking like. And oftentimes, even in that particular film, we were being reminded that a, a Disney princess doesn't show up as a black woman. Um, and that really disturbed me. And I feel like there's a need for us to be okay, even something that we see is so wholesome and fun and enjoyable, that we need to be okay to critique that institution. Not to say it has no value, but to simply acknowledge that its um, role in society does need to be critiqued so that we can protect our children and they can grow up to be very strong, self um, uh, individuals who have strong self-esteem and self-confidence and believe that they can attain whatever they want to in, in life in general. Great, thank you, that's helpful. I'm that's sorry. Helpful. No, don't <laughs> apologize, <laughs> that, that's helpful advice. Protect those girls. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely, yep, absolutely. Um, so we are unfortunately getting to the end here, but I do want to make um, a plug and a, and a request uh, for participants at home, please share uh, your UMBC degree and profession um, to show, so that we can show the broad array of industries that are alum yes, of, of the college. I would so love please that. be sure to do that uh, before wrapping up tonight. Um, but with that, I do want to thank you, Dr. Moffitt. It's been great facil facilitating this conversation with you. We really appreciate the time and we're really looking forward to all the great things you'll do as the interim dean um, of the college. And to all of you at home, uh, thank you so much for joining us tonight for this very special event. As I said in the beginning, this is the first in a series of these types of events. They all will look a little bit different, uh, but please be on the lookout for, um, for the next one, which I think is going to be in December. So with that, we will uh, wrap up. Thank you again, Dr. Moffitt. Thank, Thank you. you to those of you at home, yes. and good night.